Good morning. It is so good to see everyone this morning. If you're tuning in on Facebook, it's wonderful to have you with us as well. I'm going to try not to knock things over. Um, I just want to remind you, if you're here, it is a little warm this morning. So if you would like to turn on your cars and roll up your windows, you can tune in on 88.9, 88.9. Uh, thanks to the work of Nick Nichols, you should be able to hear us across the radio and not have to have your car turned off and your windows down on these warm July mornings. I hope you had a wonderful Independence Day yesterday. I hope you got to spend time with your family and maybe some friends. And I also hope that you took a few moments to think about all the many people over the last 240 years that have sacrificed so much that we might be able to enjoy the freedom that we have here in this wonderful country. So just thank you for joining us on this Sunday morning. I have two announcements I would like to make. The first is that immediately following our service, if you would like to make a tithe or offering, you can drive up underneath the portico and Mary Ellen will be there to collect it from you. And the second is that every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., we are having a virtual Bible study. And this past week, we had a wonderful conversation, and I hope that you'll join us this week, uh, if you didn't last week, uh, for that Bible study. I send out information normally on Monday or Tuesday of each week about how to access that Bible study. You don't have to have a computer to get on. You only need to have a phone, a cell phone, or a home phone works to join us for those Bible studies. So I encourage you to participate with us in those if you haven't already. And if you have, thank you. And I hope you'll continue to join us for those Bible studies. But we are so glad that you're here with us this morning for worship. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Most gracious God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the many ways that you bless us. We thank you most of all for the life that you have given us so freely through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning we pray we would be transformed by your love. Lord, that we would not only receive it, but we would commit to participate in it as well by sharing it with others, that they might know of your love and your care and your concern for them. Lord, as we begin to enter into worship this morning, we pray that you would move among us, that you would reveal yourself to us in a new way, that we would be reminded of who you are and who we are and who you've created us to be, that we might leave this place committed to living our life in a new and different and faithful way. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Savior that we pray. Amen. And we're very blessed this morning to have Sherry Link with us to share her musical gifts. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to her. Good morning, everyone. I know you can't, I, I can't see who you are. I know I probably know every one of you, but it's hard for me to tell who you are. But anyway, I wanna thank Susan for having me come today. Um, it's a blessing to be able to sing for the Lord and being that we're outside, it just puts a whole different light on things, but I just praise God that there's a way that we can still come together and worship. I'm gonna sing the first song is, is by Jimmy Fortune. He wrote this song. I don't know if any of you have heard it. Susan had not, so I'm not sure anybody else has. But it simply says, I believe.
comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 21. I'm going to read verses 8 through 21. So hear these words of the Lord. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered into the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the desert, or when the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and an angel of the Lord called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, we're going to have our children's sermon. And if we have any kids with us this morning, we're going to invite you to come forward. And here in front of the stage, you'll see hula hoops that are spread out about six feet apart. And just feel free to claim any of those hula hoops as your own. And Miss uh, Becky Donner is going to share our children's sermon with us. So we invite you to come forward at this time. Good morning. There comes Nicholas. He's claimed the yellow hula hoop. There comes Lacey. What will she take? And she's choosing orange. And I hope there's others of you listening at home today also. It's, it's, a warm, it's a warm Sunday morning, but it's beautiful outside at the same time. So I want you all to be really quiet for a minute, and I want you to listen, and let's see what we can hear when no one is talking. So let's be really quiet for just a minute. Hey, Lacey, what do you hear? 
do you hear some noise from out here? Like car noise or something running? We hear that noise. Nicholas, do you hear anything different? You hear some car noises also? You know, if, if we didn't have the car noises, we might be able to hear a bird or we might be able to hear the wind blowing through something or maybe even some cars on North Main Street, we might hear them coming by also. You know, listening can be really, really important in life, as we know. And listening to the message of the scripture today, people listening to God can be very important. When to trust him, and when to do something or not do something becomes really important. Knowing that God has plans for us and he's not going to desert us, he's always going to be there for us. So let's think about who we should listen to. Can you think of anyone we should listen to? Lacey? Your parents, yes, absolutely. You should listen to your parents. And your mom is nodding her head back there. Yes. <laughs> Nicholas. If we should listen to God. Exactly. We need to always hear that inner voice of God talking. Should we listen to our teachers when they're talking to us? Absolutely. Should we listen to, um, to our ministers when they're giving us information and trying to teach us things? Absolutely. Can you listen to yourself? Exactly. Yes, we can. There are times maybe when we start to do something and then we say, mm, no, maybe I shouldn't do that. Or we can hear perhaps God's voice in our head saying, think again. Maybe that's not the best choice right now, you know. So sometimes we need to think carefully about who we should listen to. And then sometimes do we listen to people we shouldn't listen to? Think about that. Have you ever had a friend try to tell you, let's do this, and you know maybe you shouldn't do it? Right. In school sometimes they might say, let's play this trick on someone or let's do something else, and you know that you probably shouldn't, so you have to listen to that inner voice in your head telling you that also. Um, gossip is another because that spreads unhappiness in a lot of ways if it's found out. So we sort of have to think as, as we go through life who we should listen to and who we shouldn't listen to. But when you listen to your inner voice, your conscience speaking to you, or God speaking to you, then we should always be comforted in knowing that someone is always there. Even when you might think you're alone, you know you always have God to listen to. And you can ask him and you will hopefully hear the right thing in your head that he's trying to get across to you and help you with then that he has our best interests at heart then. So remember that you always should listen and listen and listen. All sorts of different ways. Okay, so let's have a little prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us ears to listen with and a conscience to help us to know who we should listen to and who we shouldn't listen to. And we thank you for the examples you give us in the Bible to help us know the difference. In your name we pray. Amen. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and we'll see you here next week then. Thank you, Becky. And thank you, Nicholas and Lacey, for coming down this morning. Let's enter a time of prayer now. Almighty God, we are so blessed beyond measure. We are thankful for the many blessings that you give us, for the many ways that you lead us and guide us in this life. We are thankful for family and for friends. 
We're thankful for all that you have done for us. We ask, dear God, that you would help us each and every day to remember to follow you. Help us each and every day to open our ears and to listen to you. Listen to the still, small voice that you place inside of our hearts as you lead us and as you guide us. Help us to listen and to follow where you are guiding us. We ask, dear God, that you continue to be with those who are having or going through very difficult times right now, whether it be illness, whether it be loss of jobs or loss of loved ones, whether it be loneliness, whether it be any number of things, we ask that your presence be with them, and we ask, dear God, that you hold each of them in your heart, hold each of them close to you, giving them your peace, your comfort, your strength, and your courage. We are mindful this weekend of the celebration of the 4th of July, the celebration of our freedom, and we are thankful for that. But help us to remember also, dear God, that with great freedom comes great responsibility. The responsibility to care for others, the responsibility to listen to others, the responsibility that we have to show others your love and your grace. Help us, dear God, not to be so concerned about our own wishes and concerns that we fail to overlook the needs of others. Help us, dear God, to offer grace just as you have offered it to us. Help us to remain faithful to you just as you are faithful to us. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties this morning during our drive-in service with our Facebook live stream. You have to have internet access to be able to live stream something on Facebook. In the last few weeks, we've been using our cell phones as hotspots, which essentially turns your cell phone into an internet Wi-Fi router to allow us to have internet access so we can live stream for everyone at home. And unfortunately, because it was such a hot one out there this morning, our cell phone overheated about 20 minutes into our service, which is why we lost our live stream footage, about somewhere in the sermon, I believe. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and record the sermon, uh, and, and we'll post it on Facebook here in a little bit. Uh, and we're really sorry for the inconvenience. Technology is great in a lot of ways, but sometimes it's a little bit inconvenient too. So I appreciate you being patient with us and understanding, and we're going to try to work out these kinks we continue to have in, in the week to come. But anyway, we're glad that you're with us. A few years ago, Bridget and I were in Washington, D.C., and while we were there, we got an opportunity to go to the new Smithsonian Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. If you haven't been, it's an amazing museum. In fact, I cannot recommend it highly enough. And even though we're several years removed from our visit, there's still this one exhibit in particular that stands out to me. It was an exhibit exploring the role of Christianity on the American slave plantation. And that particular exhibit fascinated me because it tells this complicated story about how Christianity worked in two different and seemingly contradictory ways on the plantation. On the one hand, it tells the story of the Christian faith of the slave owners. I doubt this information is new to you, but the vast majority of slave owners were Christians. In fact, many were deacons and leaders and even ministers in their churches. Perhaps you're asking yourself how a Christian could ever be a slave owner. It's a fair question, I think. But unfortunately, the history is even more tragic than that. Not only were the slave owners Christians, they used their Christian faith to defend slavery and to justify enslaving others. 
They quote scripture to defend viewing the enslaved as less than human beings. They quote scripture to justify owning and buying and selling other human beings. So at the Smithsonian, there are these displays that illustrate how the slave owners quoted particular passages of scripture to justify enslaving others. It's a tragic, lamentable story, but it's only part of the story. And it's only part of the story because the slave owners weren't the only Christians on the slave plantations. See, many slave owners required the enslaved to become Christians too. In fact, on many plantations, the enslaved were required to attend worship services on Sunday mornings. They couldn't lead their worship services themselves. In fact, it was illegal to even teach a slave to read. So white preachers were brought in to lead their services. The enslaved would hear sermons about how slaves were to obey their masters. The Smithsonian has numerous examples of those kinds of sermons. And what was so remarkable to me is that no matter how perverted and frankly demonic was the faith of those slave owners, the enslaved still developed a profound faith of their own. So alongside the displays illustrating how slave owners manipulated the Bible to justify slavery, there are also displays telling the story of how the enslaved, even though they couldn't read the Bible themselves, heard the scriptures and memorized the narratives of the Bible and developed a profound faith of their own. My personal favorite was a display that was dedicated to the hymns, the spirituals the enslaved created while working in the fields. They take familiar rhythms and mel melodies from the hymns they sang on Sundays and they'd make up lyrics that connected the plight of the Hebrew slaves in Egypt to their own lives as slaves. And what they were able to create are these amazing and heartfelt songs that proclaimed their hope that one day God would hear their cries just like God heard the cries of his people in Egypt all those years before, and that God would free them from their slavery too. See, what emerged from this exhibit is this really complicated but captivating story of how Christianity on the American slave plantation. And what you learn is that on the plantation, Christianity simultaneously served as both the thing used to justify the oppression of slaves, and as the thing empowering those slaves to endure and overcome their slavery too. And what's so remarkable to me is that even though those slave owners were such horrific witnesses of Christ, even though they utterly failed to share God's love, the very people their sins hurt the most, the slaves, still found reason to place their hope in God. It's an astonishing story of how Christians can so often fail and fail miserably at being the people of God. Yet somehow God still works through our failures to offer his life to people in need. Here in Genesis 21, we get another example of God extending grace and hope and life to people who find themselves mistreated by the people of God. Our scripture is a story about a person, Sarah, who receives God's love but then fails to share God's love with others. In the seven verses preceding our scripture, Sarah, the 90-year-old wife of Abraham, finally receives the son the Lord promised to her some 24 years before. Genesis 21 verses 1 to 7 tell of Sarah holding her baby boy Isaac in her arms for the very first time. It tells of Sarah's pure joy and of the overwhelming gratitude she feels upon finally receiving the long-awaited promise of God. So when we meet Sarah, there's no doubt she's experienced God's goodness. There's no doubt she's experienced what it's like to receive God's blessing and God's undeserved and unearned grace. Sarah knows better than anyone, perhaps, what it's like to receive God's love and have one's life forever transformed. 
And see, in my mind, this is what makes Sarah's actions in our story so disheartening and so disappointing. Our story picks up in the aftermath of Sarah's spiritual high. A few years had passed since Isaac's birth, enough time for Isaac to be weaned. And in verse 8, Sarah and Abraham throw Isaac a celebratory feast. But then something happens during this feast that sours their celebration. In verse 9, Ishmael, Isaac's half-brother, who was probably around 15 or 16 years old at the time, does something that captures Sarah's attention. The Hebrew is actually pretty ambiguous, so it's not entirely clear what Ishmael does, but we're told that Ishmael either mocks or laughs at Isaac. We don't know whether Ishmael was just being immature like all teenage boys are from time to time, or if he actually does something quite sinister. But regardless of what Ishmael does, his behavior captures Sarah's attention. It troubles Sarah. In fact, it troubles Sarah so much she calls for Abraham, and in verse 10, Sarah tells Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my own son. Get rid of that slave woman and her son. As I read this scripture, I was immediately struck by the fact that throughout this passage, Sarah never refers to Ishmael or Hagar by name. They're always that slave woman and her son. I don't think this is merely a coincidence. In fact, the more I think about it, the more I believe it's actually a rather telling detail in our text. See, Sarah's refusal to refer to Hagar or Ishmael by name tells me that Sarah doesn't think too highly of either of them. In fact, I'd even go so far as to question whether Sarah even views them as fellow human beings deserving of love or respect. Perhaps you think I'm being harsh towards Sarah. But I say this because to me it seems like Sarah is only capable of viewing Hagar and especially Ishmael as threats. She witnesses Ishmael mock or laugh at Isaac. And instead of looking past Ishmael's immature behavior, much less forgiving it, Sarah chooses to condemn Ishmael for it. Sarah chooses to view Ishmael as a threat. A threat to the life she desires for her own son, Isaac. A threat to the inheritance she believes belongs rightfully only to Isaac. But I believe Ishmael's presence threatens Sarah, too. And I believe Ishmael's presence threatens Sarah because Ishmael's presence must remind Sarah of that one time all those years before when she failed to trust in God's promises, when she failed to be fully faithful to God. Ishmael must constantly remind Sarah of that time she grew impatient with God, that time she sent her husband Abraham into another woman's arms. Perhaps watching Ishmael laugh at Isaac reminded Sarah of that time she laughed at God. See, I'd imagine Ishmael's presence constantly reminds Sarah of her own brokenness, of her own sins and imperfections. So Sarah believed Ishmael posed a threat to Isaac, sure, but Ishmael posed a threat to Sarah's own self-righteousness, too. And because Sarah views Hagar and Ishmael as threats to the life that she wants for herself and her son, she commands Abraham to get rid of them. And we just heard the rest of our story. Abraham was greatly troubled by Sarah's request. Verse 11 tells us the matter distressed Abraham greatly. And it distressed Abraham greatly because Ishmael was every bit as much of Abraham's son as was Isaac. Sarah was asking Abraham to cast his own son away. But in the midst of Abraham's despair, God speaks to him. God tells Abraham not to be concerned about Hagar and Ishmael because just like God would bless Isaac, God was going to bless Ishmael too. So early the next morning, Abraham packed some supplies and placed them on Hagar's shoulders before he sent them on their way. And at first, things don't look so good for Hagar and Ishmael. 
their water runs out and then so does their food. They find themselves stranded in the desert with nothing to eat and nowhere to go. They fear they're about to die. But in the midst of their tears, the miraculous happens. God hears their sobs. God speaks to Hagar, reassuring her that he will provide and look out for both of them. God shows Hagar and Ishmael the mercy and love that Sarah denied them. When Sarah chose to view Hagar and Ishmael as threats, God recognized they were worthy of love. And I thought a lot about this scripture, and I can't help but think Sarah really failed Hagar and Ishmael. I'm not trying to excuse Ishmael's behavior, whatever it was. But I can't help but wonder how in one story, Sarah can be so overwhelmed by the love of God, a love she knew she did not deserve. Yet in the very next story, Sarah's just entirely unwilling to share that love with someone else. So I believe Sarah failed Hagar. She failed Ishmael. Sarah received God's blessing in Isaac. She held God's blessing in her arms and recognized how through it her life had been forever transformed. Yet when she had an opportunity to share the same grace and mercy and undeserved love God had just given to her, she chose to judge and condemn and forsake instead. So Sarah failed Hagar. She failed Ishmael, and in so doing, I believe Sarah failed God as well. Sarah failed to recognize God's love isn't meant to be hoarded away or kept only for oneself. Sarah failed to recognize the most beautiful thing about God's love is that even though we could never do anything to earn it, God still gives it to us, and God gives it to us so freely. And as if that wasn't already amazing enough, God also invites us to participate in his love by sharing it with others as well. So here Sarah had an opportunity to share the love of God with Hagar and Ishmael. She had an opportunity to forgive and forget, to let bygones be bygones. Sarah had an opportunity to share the love that had so radically transformed her life and that would radically transform their lives as well but Sarah chose to condemn instead. It would be easy, too easy for me to judge Sarah for her unwillingness to share God's love with Hagar and Ishmael. But the more I thought about Sarah, the more I realized maybe I'm not all that different than her. And perhaps you'll disagree, but I'd imagine neither are any of you. And I say that because so often we receive God's goodness, we receive God's love, but like Sarah, we refuse to share God's love with others in return. So often we choose to be divided. We let disagreements and differences, especially differing political beliefs, drive a wedge between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. We refuse to forgive, we hold on to grudges, we let friendships break down and relationships dissolve. From time to time, we deny others the dignity and worth and respect they deserve, the dignity and worth and respect we expect from them. Like Sarah, we readily accept God's grace and God's mercy and God's unconditional forgiveness for our own brokenness and sin. But so often we refuse to extend that same grace and mercy and unconditional forgiveness to someone else. That exhibit on the role of Christianity on the American slave plantation led me to spend a lot of time thinking about how well-meaning Christians, and I believe in their day they believed they were well-meaning, could have ever supported something as obviously evil as slavery, much less used their Christian faith, used the Bible to justify it. 150 years later, their sin, and that's what it was, sin, seems so evident and so obvious to me. But it also causes me to pause. 
and to think about what the church will think of us and our faithfulness to Christ 150 years from now. I wonder if there are any skeletons in our proverbial closet. Sins that Christians several generations from now will discover and wonder how could those well-meaning Christians ever believe or allow or say absolutely nothing about something like that. Let's think about all the things going on in our world today. All you have to do is turn on the news or log on to Facebook to see there is so much hate and anger and division in our world. I mean, we are even divided over whether we should wear a mask, a tiny piece of cloth. We're divided over something that's sole purpose. Its sole purpose is to help us protect others, to protect the people around us. Is that really something we want to be divided over? Church, it doesn't have to be this way. And I think we all know that. But over the past few weeks, I've really wondered what Christians 150 years from now, or just 10 years from now for that matter, will think about how we responded when they look back at what we were doing during this hateful and divisive time. I've wondered if they will look back and find us faithful. Will they see that as the church we chose to rise above the hate and the anger and the division, because it is our choice. Will they see that we placed our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, the only person, the only person worthy of pledging our, pledging our allegiance to? Or will they look back and lament because we decided to place our hope and our trust in something or someone else instead? Will they look back and lament over the fact that when we had a chance to rise above the hate, to call it out for what it is and to take a prophetical and biblical stand against it, we chose to participate in it instead? Will they look back in shock because far from rising above the, hang the anger of our current political moment, we allowed ourselves to become angry instead? I've wondered if future Christians will look back on us, if they will recognize the wonderful opportunity we had to be a voice for unity and compassion and empathy during such a hateful and divisive time. And if they will be saddened because instead of rising to the occasion that's before us, we chose to take the easier path and perpetuate the division instead. Church, our world, our country is hurting. People in our own community are hurting. They've lost their jobs. They've lost loved ones. They've lost hope in their future. They don't know what the world looks like for their children and grandchildren. And though I wish I so desperately wish I could say differently, I believe our leaders are failing us today. And I say that because instead of trying to bring us together, instead of calling for compassion and empathy and understanding, instead of trying to bridge the many divides that are ripping us apart, our leaders are stoking our hatred. They are seeking to further our division. They are trying to divide us because they know their power depends on our division. So this morning, I am imploring you, imploring you, don't forsake your Christian witness by placing your hope in a politician. Don't give in to the hate that they spew, and so many of them are spewing hate right now. Don't be caught up in the anger they perpetuate. Don't believe and spread the lies and mistruths they share. Don't let yourself be divided against your brothers and sisters, your fellow human beings made in the image and likeness of God and loved by God because they look and think and live and sin differently than you. Church, we live in a hurting world. But in this hurting world, we have this wonderful opportunity to be the church today. The lesson of our scripture is that, is that God's at work, God's at work, 
in our world. And just like Sarah, the choice before us is whether we will work with God or against God. We can choose to either share the love God's given to us so freely, a love we don't deserve, a love we could never earn, or we can hoard it away for ourselves instead. But either way, God's work, God's faithfulness is not going to be hampered by our unfaithfulness. Just like God reached out to Hagar and Ishmael when Sarah denied them God's love, God is reaching out to the people we choose to ignore, the people we write off, the people we refuse to listen to or empathize with, the people our political leaders want us to be divided against. So do we want our legacy to be that we worked with God or against him? Do we want to be remembered as people who were willing to receive God's love but not to share it with others? Or do we want to be remembered for being the people who rose above the division and hate and anger in our world by deciding to share God's love instead? Church, the choice is ours. So my prayer is that we will commit to not only receive God's love, but to use our lives each waking moment of every single day to share that love with others as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the life that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that we have done nothing to earn that life or deserve it. In fact, Lord, you look down on us in our sin and our brokenness and our imperfections, those things that should divide us and separate us from you for eternity. And instead of choosing to condemn us or forsake us or judge us, you chose to love us, to come down into this earth in Jesus, to live as we live and suffer as we suffer and even die as we will die, that we might find our life in you. So, Lord, this morning we thank you for the life and the love that you've given us through Jesus Christ. We pray that we would not only receive it, Lord, but we would participate in it by sharing it with others as well. Because we know the only way your salvation comes to this earth is if we commit to join you where you're at work, to share the love that you've given us so freely with others, that they might know of your love and your care and your concern for them too. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Again, we're sorry about our technical difficulties this morning. We are trying to work these things out, but there's always different things that come up and we never exactly know um, what we need to do, but we're trying to figure out and we just appreciate how patient and understanding and encouraging you've been through all of this. God bless. To have faith. It's when we get down in the valleys of our trials that it's hard to keep our faith. But that's what we have to do, folks. We have to always have faith whether we're up on that mountain or down in that valley. So I'm going to sing for you, God on the Mountain. Thank you. Thank you for coming and singing and sharing um, your talent with us this morning. And thank each of you for being here with us um, and for those that listened to us on the live stream this morning. Would you receive this blessing as we depart today? May the God, excuse me, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.